You're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social magazine that's broadcast in English and Persian by New Channel TV. Hello everyone, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Borspuya. In this week's program, we'll be discussing pro-imperialist left. We'll be interviewing Mariam Halaluka, the founder of Secularism is a Woman's Issue. In shocking news of the week, we'll be talking about another hacking to death of a Bangladeshi blogger with the name of Rahman. In the insane fatwa of the week, it's from ISIS. And if you're going to play table football, you better decapitate the little plastic men first. The good news of the week is from Sweden again, the campaign to end the ban on women entering st stadiums in Iran is a spreading. Stay with us. The role of the left is to be partisan and take sides with progressive social forces. However, the postmodernist anti-imperialist so-called left sides with the Islamists and participates in the elimination of progressive movements and free thinkers in the Middle East, North Africa and South Asia. This left, and I really think we shouldn't call them left anymore, this so-called left is siding with the Islamists and in reality aiding and abetting and justifying and apologizing for the murder of free thinkers and progressive social movements in countries across the world from the Middle East to South Asia and North Africa. I think you made an important point. Should we call them left or not? I don't think they're, they're left. Historically, they're anti-colonialist, the supporter of a, so, you know, the nationalist movement for independence, and now they morphed with the uh, Islamist movement because the whole nationalist movement in the Middle East, in North Africa, in Southeast Asia, they merge into Islamist movement, they're very close with each other. Um, and I think these groups are supporters of that movement and they're now part and parcel of the Islamist movement. The difference is that now the Islamist movement is a fascist movement um, and they are supporters of fascists. So they're a very dangerous uh, uh, group, I think, for society. And in Europe, you'll see them, they're always sitting side by side with the Islamists and usually the most, the right-wing section of the Islamist movement, mm -hmm. the most sort of fascist and The outrageous. whole Islamist movement is right-wing. But, um, you know, absolutely. But these the, are the, the, the most, the the most the the horrible yeah. uh, groups. They, they have no shame of supporting them and they need to be exposed as a part and parcel of a right-wing movement, an emergence of a right-wing mo movement in Middle East and North Africa. You know, there's nothing progressive anymore about them at all. I mean, there were some, well, you know, it, it, it was justified to support anti-colonial movements, but now they look at Islamists as a sort of force of, for resistance and a revolutionary force, where in fact they're a counter-revolutionary force. They are responsible for suppressing revolutions, for slaughtering free thinkers and progressive movements, for, atta for attacking the working class in many countries, and they're standing side by side with this movement. Yeah, and they pretend to be anti somehow anti-establishment you know, it's always these elements of a fascist movement who goes against some sort of rules and regulation. Even when you look at the right-wing movements in Europe, there's always that sort of anti-establishment element within that. And uh, the same sort of groups in Middle East and North Africa, there's some sort of, again, some sort of structure and establishment. And they side by that. And they, they try to pretend this is this element of progressive um, there's progressive elements in this that isn't actually. And what's interesting is this um, so-called left has the sort of affinity with Islam and Islamism in the way that they might not necessarily have it with uh, Judaism or Christianity. You know, they, they do yeah. see it as sort of a, a, a repressed or, or a, the oppressed religion and they see Islamism as a force, you know, for resistance in a sense which yeah. is it's not at all in any shape and form and, and, and this is part of the narrative that uh, um, Islamists try to uh, uh, peddle um, in, in society and they're bought into this mm. I mean it's it's interesting we're going to now speak uh, listen to Maria Mahela Lucas speak about the roots of uh, this left and also how in reality, they are aiding and abetting the murder, the mass murder and slaughter of free thinkers, the working class and progressive social movements in our region. Welcome, Maria Mahela Lucas. I wanted to ask you, what are the characteristics of a left that is increasingly pro-Islamist? 
but as I, uh, the left is generally, traditionally, against the state. So their analysis fails to take into account the proliferation of non-state actors, which have been there for several decades already, but they still s stick to their old analysis, individuals versus the state. And how does this affect the movement, uh, progressive movement, against the Islamists? If I think of Algeria, for instance, we have been banging at the doors, not just of the left, but also the far left and also human rights organizations, to help us become more visible and give us legitimacy in our struggle against the fundamental, it's far right, because that's what it is, it's a fascist type movement, uh, disguised as a religious movement, but it's a political movement. And we had absolutely no success. So the arguments they are using to justify their position of abandonment of the left in Muslim countries is uh, of two types. One is a very human rights approach, which is oh, it's their religion, it's their culture. And the second one is a more left approach, uh, where they stand against oppressive and democratic government and corrupt governments, or they stand against imperialism. So neither of these arguments are valid. And if you uh, if it's okay with you, I think I would like to develop this. On the first argument about it's their religion, it's their culture, one can say that they homogenize both religion and culture and they essentialize both religion and culture. If one looks at the fact that Muslims are spread on all continents, it's really quite unbelievable to pretend that there's only one culture. And just looking at dress codes, you know, from saris to boos, from South Asia to Sub-Saharan Africa, there's a wide range of traditional clothing. And focusing on the Middle Eastern forms of clothing and of veiling, and pretending that this is religious instead of being adapted to geographical and uh, circumstances is absolutely crazy. I mean, how can I, anyone pretend there is one Muslim culture? Um, as far as religion is concerned, of course, they are only concerned with the most retrograde and uh, conservative interpretations of religion. They never look at what progressive thinkers in Islam say. And just um, for the sake of giving an example, uh, Sohib Benshir, who is of Algerian descent and who was for a long time the great mufti of Marseille in France, gives this very interesting analysis of the, the veil being Islamic. He says, what was the purpose of the veil at the time of the prophet? It was a way to s separate the slaves who were forced to go half naked with their breasts uncovered and the decent wives of uh, well-to-do people who had to be covered in order precisely not to be harassed by the man in the street. So Ben Shir says this was a way to make sure that the dignity of these women was not attacked. And then he goes on saying it's not a piece of cloth today which performs the same uh, you know, purpose. Yes. Um, today, what grants, what, what gives assurance to a woman to be respected in society is the fact that she's educated, she's better equipped to face society, and that's how she conquers her dignity in society. So he concludes that the modern equivalent of the veil is education. 
So these are interpreters of the Quran who are never ever quoted, neither by the left nor by human rights organizations. And it's interesting because in so doing, they actually support the most conservative and the most aggressive interpretations of Islam. As an atheist myself, I'm not concerned with involving myself in reform of Islam, but just for the sake of saying that they take sides, even if they don't declare it, by promoting the views of the fascists in Islam. What about, I mean, this whole argument that my enemy's enemy is, is a friend? I mean, is that a permissible perspective to take? This is what the left often says they're That's doing. what the left says, yeah. Well, the first part of uh, uh, my response was more about human rights. The, but the human rights views are contaminating the left and have been doing so for quite some time. Certainly since the 90s in Algeria, I've been aware of that that we receive from the left non-partisan responses, supposedly apolitical responses, which are immediately taken from the philosophy of human rights organizations. And this is not the role of the left. What, what is the role of the left? The role of the left should be to be partisan and to openly take side, and hopefully with us, not with the fascists. In what way can... Let, let me sorry. finish with this question of um, the enemy of my enemy, etc. Uh, that brings me back to the argument that um, uh, because people, quote-unquote, people, the people, revolt against undemocratic, oppressive, corrupt governments, they need to be supported regardless of their political agenda. and. Supposedly, because they oppose imperialist countries, which are well represented by our governments, let's say. Hmm? So I think this is a terrible mistake for the left to believe for one second that fascist movements are anti-imperialist. The reform, the social reform that fundamentalist uh, organizations are proposing the world over. It's zakat. Just, uh, how do you say? Give, Give arms. arms to the poor so that you don't disturb the social strata, the social um, power structure. So if this is going to fight against imperialism, let me laugh. Uh, what they fail to do, and I think this is absolutely unacceptable, is to have a political analysis of the right-wing, and in fact extreme right, nature of the fundamentalist movements. And I want to say that they have a lot in common with Nazis and fascists at the level of ideology. I know historians will jump to my throat because Nothing can be compared to fascism in Europe in the, at the time of the Second World War and before. But if we look at their ideology, they share with the Nazis and fascists the belief that they are a superior, not race, but creed. That nothing is superior to their creed. Uh, they base this fantasy, I would say, on the myth mythical past, whether it's the glorious past of Rome or the Aryan race, or in the case of um, Muslims, the golden age of Islam. And also based on that, they feel they have a right and a duty to eliminate the Untermensch. At the time, of the Nazis, it was the Jews and the communists and the gays and the mentally handicapped, etc., etc. Gypsies, not to forget them. And now it's the coffers in a very general way, and also the Jews, the gays, etc. So I think this is extremely dangerous. And they have, as they say, God on their side, just like the SS had the 
on their pocket, on their belt, yeah, God on my side, yeah. So I think failing to see the similarities and thinking we can ally as a left worldwide with these people, this is dramatic in my views. And uh, I think the left in Europe and North America, but also in Asia and Africa, uh, is participating in the elimination of any progressive thinking, any progressive movements all over the so-called Muslim world. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that interview with uh, Maria Mahela Lucas. I think she raises a, a hugely important point about the, f you know, the whole concept of my enemy's enemy is my friend. And the fact of the matter is that you can't just look at a movement for what it is against or perceived to, to be against or what it says it's against, but also one needs to look at its actual platform, what its policies are, uh, what it's fighting for. And in effect, Islamism is a form of imperialism as well today. And I agree. I think when we look at uh, um, the experience of Maryam and many other people who we've interviewed on Bread and Roses, it clearly shows that the Islamist movement uh, is a right-wing fascist movement. And when we analyze uh, the practice, uh, Maryam dissects it quite nicely, both on, on the level of or the issue of um, human rights as well as through the traditional left sort of uh, ground. Um, when you look at all those experiences, you'll see uh, there's no benefit um, at all. It's actually quite a suppressive fascist movement in every aspect of the, uh, uh, the life and in many different countries. They act as the most right-wing groups and um, anybody who supports uh, these groups are, you know, part of the fascist movement. Mm. I am sorry to say that groups who pretend to be left, uh, they support these groups, they are part in the shadows of the fascist movement and people need to wake up to, to, to danger of these groups. And I mean the reality is that this whole my enemy's enemy is my friend is an absurd sort of position to take. Uh, let's say we're against the Islamic regime of Iran, that means then we should be for US imperialism and the bombing of Iran. Yes. No, yeah. we can be against both, we can see why both are not a progressive response and we can give another response and that's what the left has historically done is to show another path. Aligning with the far right isn't going to help, it, it won't help us in our campaign against Sharia law here in, the, in, in Europe and it definitely doesn't help aligning with the Islamists against even even dictatorships in other countries because they're part of the problem, not the solution. No, absolutely, and, and the correct position, for example, when the United States attacked Iraq was, and we rightly said, we condemn that attack. We think that's part and parcel of reshaping of the Middle East and giving rise to the right-wing groups, which we've seen it's happened, as well as opposing the Islamists as uh, uh, the right-wing solution, you know, the actually capitalist solution to, to the Middle East. And this is a justifiable position. Their position, it's quite uh, negative, and it has, you know, the only the only benefit of this is the rise of the Islamists, and they are part and parcel of this movement, and we have without any shadow of a doubt. Yeah, I mean, I think you can't really even just say that they're a, you know, it's not enough to say that they're you know, just standing side by side with the Islamists. Yeah, the they're actually them, yeah. apologizing for them, they're justifying them, they're legitimizing them, and they are creating space for them to have influence. And in a, they're also, we often see, they're attacking the dissenters and, and those who are standing up to the Islamists as racists and Islamophobes. And so you can see how they work hand in hand with them to bring forth their inhuman agenda, whether it's here in Europe with Sharia laws and the Burqa um, and Islamic schools and gender segregation, or in the Middle East and North Africa where you see them supporting groups like the Muslim Brotherhood, the Islamic regime of Iran, Assad in Syria, all at the expense of, you know, <laughs> large numbers of people. Yes, they have morphed uh, into the Islamic, broad Islam Islamist movement, and they are part and parcel of it, as you said, mm -hmm. I agree. And I think it's it's actually, you know, I think Mariama talks about how it's just so astonishing to see, uh, you know, people who consider themselves progressive, political movements that consider th themselves progressive, to, si to see them siding with the fascists, you know. And there's no excuse for it. There's no justification for it. It is appalling. It is 
a politics, as we've said before, a politics of betrayal. It is betraying people like Farhunde in Afghanistan. It is betraying Avijit Roy and Rahman in uh, Bangladesh. And it is betraying, uh, you know, um, the trade unionists in Iran to the secularists um, in Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, and elsewhere. It's, it's something that has to be vehemently condemned. It is possible to have a progressive alternative to uh, fascism, and that's not siding with another bunch of fascists. In shocking news of the week, we're talking about another Bangladeshi blogger by the name of Rahman who has been hacked to death. And he was hacked in such a bad way that the police could not identify him other than by looking at his identity card. And I mean, what's this, interesting this is heartbreaking. Is, oh, it is. Yeah. I mean, it's outrageous how many of our free thinkers have to be slaughtered in this way until, you know, governments uh, take these Islamists seriously and act on them. Bangladesh has not done anything, the government, in stopping these Islamists. No one has been prosecuted for the murder of Avijit, for this murder, and for other murders that have taken place against bloggers. And this is interesting that uh, Bangladesh has a history of a strong secularism and the, the state, the government, has a bare responsibility, a serious responsibility. Mm -hmm. yeah. Islamists as well, you know, Islamists, na naturally, they, they are, uh, you know, the, the, the driving force for this. But the governments have a role to play. They, they justify, they, either they're scared of them or mm -hmm. they work with, with them hand in hand. They have a role to play and we need to uh, bring, you know, put pressure on the Bangladeshi government um, to protect the right of the uh, citizen to uh, be able to criticize religion and, ha and, know, live, and enjoy and live, free and thinking as well. And yeah. unfortunately, that's not the case. Yeah. I mean, the thing is that it seems some bystanders caught two of the men that, uh, that hacked uh, Rahman to death. And they were asked at the police uh, why they did this. And they didn't know what a blog was. And they had never read his writings. So this is just a killing machine. They talk about offended Muslim sensibilities. They don't even know what they're offended they about. They just ignorance. want to kill anyone who doesn't think Absolutely. like them. They rely on, on, on ignorance of the uh, you know population that they exist and it's a reality but the, the are the, the right wing driving forces who do that old fascist movements use ignorance as as the pillar of their activity mm. i think it's important for us to really rage against these this murder and abhijit roy's murder and the attack on on bloggers if we look at the case in afghanistan and farhunde's murder we see that public protest and outrage has resulted in arrests and has resulted in the suspension of police who stood by. We have to make sure that not another blogger is killed in Bangladesh. And to do that, we need to embarrass the Bangladeshi government to take action and to take it now. The insane fatwa of the week is from ISIS, and they've got a fatwa about their um, you know, their, their brothers, when they're playing table uh, football, they're allowed to play it. But just in case they get confused, they've got to first decapitate the heads of the plastic football players, just in case one of them looks like Muhammad. Oh. I know, that, I mean, that, that's just <laughs> it, bad. It, it, it's just silly, you know. They, it, it seems like they, they, they've got a habit of decapitation. I mean, it's Even plastic figures plastic are not safe. And, and it's absolutely, <laughs> and to kill it. <laughs> Um, it, it's crazy. It only happens in under Islamist in uh, in in ISIS controlled area. I mean, the reality is that you know it, it, the image uh, for them it's um, it shouldn't exist. So this is a sort of little figure. So um, get rid of the image of anything that might look like Muhammad. Mm, scary. <laughs> Now the good news uh, is from Sweden again, um, that the, the movement to end the ban uh, on women entering stadiums in Iran is a spreading. Uh, there was a football match between the Iranian football team and the Swedish football team in Stockholm, and there was huge protest outside and inside the stadium. Uh, banners were opened and there were interviews, and it was great. A very on uh, Mahin Alipur. Uh, Shirin Shams and Maria, Rashi, uh, Maria Rashidi, 
um, wrote in the Express newspaper in Stockholm and there were a couple of TV interviews. It was great. And five of the uh, Swedish football team came out in support of the end to brilliant, ban the, brilliant, uh, um, brilliant, brilliant. Uh, the uh, woman entering studios. In I mean, this is how absurd things are. You know, the fact that women cannot come into a stadium where men are playing. The excuse that the regime gives is because, oh, they don't want women to hear bad words and curse words being heard. They don't know that we women also curse and say bad words. And, Do you? And <laughs> never. <laughs> and that I think our ears can manage it. I mean, it's just offensive. You know, the excuses they give to stop women from entering and participating in important events like sports. People love sports, especially in, in a place like Iran. Women, men love football. And there's so many uh, you know, incidences of, for example, women dressing up as men so they can sneak into the stadium. There's even been a film by Jafar Panahi on this issue yes. called Offside, yes. which is a lovely film if people haven't seen it, that just shows how yeah. desperate people are to so get in. So this movement is spreading in, in Italy, we saw earlier, in, in March the 8th, uh, there was a, a campaign uh, in support of removing the ban. Um, FIFA is getting involved, and the fact that uh, f uh, you know so some of the members of the Swedish uh, team have come out in support is great, and there were a lot of recep good receptions uh, in Sweden, and we wish well uh, for everybody who's taken part in this campaign, Mahin Alipur, Shirin Shams, and. Maria, Maria Rashidi has been leading this campaign. And, and people really need to support the campaign to end a ban of women in football stadiums, for goodness sakes. Enough is enough. Yes, I think, are we, are we going to We've say goodbye? I think <laughs> yeah, this I is think where so. we are now. <laughs> yes, yeah. go ahead. Uh, I mean, yeah, let me, let me carry on. Then. Uh, the thing is, we wanted to tell you that we're, we've got two weeks off. Uh, we won't be able to do programs for two weeks. We'll be back on April 28th and 29th. The rest is going, yes. He's got two weeks off. He's got he two thinks weeks he off. does. He thinks he does, yeah. <laughs> So, but we'll be back. So don't, uh, you know, uh, don't be disappointed. We'll be back. We know you're dying to see our programs. It'll only be two weeks. And we have an interview actually lined up already for our program with the wonderful um, uh, Tunisian filmmaker Nadia Elfani. Yes, great. And we tell uh, our viewers about your haircut later on in our next program. <laughs> um, so from me and Mariam, for both of us, goodbye yeah. till um, next um, program. Yes, bye. Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to a year's anniversary. And yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt. And that's why the, you need to support us. We are and the vo alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa. Of corruption and immorality. So do support us. Here's a short video from Patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week. That's nothing. Support us. Patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators. It's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or webcomics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream. And in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.